welcome everyone and, and thank you for joining us at the third meeting of the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking. Uh, we've, had, we've had two full meetings of the Commission so far. Our, our first meeting uh, in the summer was a chance for us to gather for the first time and get introduced to the Commission's charge. Our second meeting was devoted entirely to thinking about issues related to privacy and the importance of privacy considerations in developing our findings and, and recommendations. We're now turning to the field of program evaluation, which is obviously a, a, a critically important community for us to hear from in terms of uh, what needs to happen to generate the relevant and rigorous evidence needed to support policymaking. So our, we, have, we have several goals for today, and we, we want to develop a better understanding of some of the barriers faced by evaluators in terms of generating evidence, and also to understand some of the opportunities for how better access to data can and the evaluation that could result from that can support and improve programs that serve the public good. We're really looking forward to hearing from our, our nine speakers, um, and I don't want to Oh, thanks. I don't, I don't want to talk too long because we're really here to, to hear from them. We're, we're certainly looking forward to leaving today with a better understanding of where the gaps in access to data are and, and what might be done about that. I might mention that in addition to the formal meetings of the uh, commission that have been held last year, last two weeks ago, rather, we held the, the first of three planned public hearings to hear from members of the public and others who uh, wanted to speak to, to us. We heard at that public hearing from 16 witnesses that represented a variety of organizations, including representatives from the American Evaluation Association, the Pew MacArthur Results First, uh, Results for America, and, and a number of other organizations. If you're interested in uh, that hearing, the written statements that were presented and the video recording of the hearing are available on our website, which is cep.gov. I was surprised, I will say, to learn that more than 800 people had already viewed the hearing. I, I didn't realize that this was such an <laughs> exciting topic uh, for members of the public to, to come in and, and learn about. Um, so, and in any event, I, I do want to thank you all for, for joining us and uh, for what I, I'm sure will be a productive discussion this morning. Ron, do you? I do, yes. Thank you. Um, so we've already collected a ton of information about programs that uh, could be better, uh, we could have more information for policymakers about uh, so that they can improve government programs and also uh, for researchers. We're going to have plenty more occasions to hear from the public and from professionals and anybody who thinks they have something to say to us. The Commission's broadest charge is to identify a strategy for ensuring that evidence uh, increasingly informs public policy. So that's why we're so anxious to get views from the public. And for those of you who would like to give us your ideas about how we can achieve this goal, we're accepting input directly through requests for comments that was advertised in the Federal Register. Uh, and we also, as Catherine mentioned, are going to have two more public hearings. We've had one already. We'll have one in Chicago. Uh, and we'll have one somewhere on the West Coast. I don't think we've decided yet, have we? Uh, so uh, my, my money's on Seattle, but we'll be on the West Coast. Uh, oh, I meant to say Berkeley. I'm sorry. Uh, so, ooh, that, that's unfair. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so before we lose control here, uh, something that I'm quite used to. Uh, I encourage everyone to pro provide us with information uh, to be as specific as possible. There are lots of glaring generalities that we hear repeatedly, and specific ideas, specific recommendations, what you think the commission should report on and what it should consider. That's really the most important thing uh, uh, that we should hear um, uh, to help policymakers and researchers uh, do better. And as many of you know, today, just a few blocks away, the, uh, the Association of Public Policy Analysis and Management is hosting its annual conference. And there's several of us that are involved in that conference, like our first, first witness. We're giving her an award today at the APAM. 
well-deserved. Uh, so we're going to be going back and forth a little bit, so we're going to try not to be disruptive when we do that, but we hope you'll forgive us if we do. Now, turning to our speakers, <clears throat> each of the speakers has been asked to limit your presentation to 12 minutes or less, we like less, uh, to allow us time for questions. We think the question period is the most important. And please be sure to stay on the limit, but just in case you have any trouble, right over there somewhere is a little device at two minutes, it will turn yellow, and then at 30 seconds, it will turn red, and then at zero seconds, it says end, and there's a fine spray that will leap across, <laughs> and the spray is deadly, so I'm sure none of you will want to violate those, uh, the time limits. So uh, our first witness uh, is Demeter Nightingale, whom I just mentioned. Uh, she is in an extremely important position that I hope replicates in other agencies um, uh, to increase their evaluation capacity. She's the Chief Evaluation Officer of the U.S. Department of Labor, uh, and I've talked with her on several occasions, including once at lunch, and heard a lot about what she's doing, and this is an ideal thing. This is really a good idea. In fact, I'm going to suggest we have something like this in our report, to have someone in each agency that does a lot of research that is in charge of evaluation and, above all, that has a budget. And Demetra has done a tremendous job, so we're so ha happy to have you here, Demetra. Time. Okay. Um, thank you. you I'm know, gonna... Oh, by the way, these mics. These are great Stop mics. The timer. But look. No, no, keep it going. She's losing time every second. Uh, I've already lost five minutes. Um, okay, listen, this is really important. These mics are really good, but if they're away from you like this, they don't work at all. You've got to bring them in close and Push the button so it turns red, and don't get confused. That doesn't mean stop. That means speak. No? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, um, I'm Demetra Nightingale from the U.S. Department of Labor. I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, what we do, the kinds of evaluations we do, how we get um, data, and uh, some of the issues around accessing information that we need and use. And then um, I'll end with some suggestions that would help, help us do evaluations better that I think fall under the uh, Commission's purview. Um, first, um, for those who don't know, the Department of Labor's uh, mission is to improve the well-being, welfare, and uh, employment-related uh, activities for wage earners, job seekers, and retirees uh, of the U.S. We also work in other countries as well. Um, there are over a dozen operating agencies in the department. Many of them have sub-agencies, lots of uh, programs, and uh, over 17 or 18,000 uh, staff around the country. Um, we have um, responsibility for worker protection and labor standards. That includes agencies like OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health, but also the Mine Safety and Health Administration, the Wage and Hour Division, which enforces uh, minimum wage, overtime, and child labor laws, the, um, the uh, Workers' Compensation Program. We also have employment services and job training and employment training in uh, the Employment and Training Administration and in the Veterans Employment and Training Service and uh, Unemployment Insurance. Um, we also have policy advocacy organizations through the Office of Disability Employment Policy, the Women's Bureau, and the International Labor Affairs Bureau that works with other countries uh, doing uh, grant making and evaluations of those grants around worker protection. And then we, many of the agencies in the department have research analysis and or evaluation offices. So our office, the Chief Evaluation Office, is a departmental evaluation office that um, complements but doesn't centralize all evaluation activities. We have an important role as being the hub of evaluation and data issues for evaluation and analysis. Um, we have an evaluation budget and uh, authority that continues to grow each, each year over the past five years. And uh, our job is to raise the uh, quality of the evaluations that are done, the awareness and understanding of what evaluation means. And importantly and related to this commission is to improve the quality of, use of uh, data. Um, and we have a data analytics unit 
that uh, does consultative analysis with all of the agencies, particularly around using the administrative data within the departments, both on the employment and training side and on the worker protection side. And we coordinate very closely with the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Performance Management Center on data and analysis issues. Um, this chart gives you a little sense of people always ask, how do we come up with what our evaluations, uh, what evaluations we're going to do? And this chart uh, lays it out pretty simply, I think, which is uh, we look at the strategic plan for the department and the priority uh, goals and objectives that are in the department's strategic priorities, its strategic plan. Congressional requirements, often Congress has uh, statutory requirements for evaluations. OMB guidance around uh, evaluations. We take all of those, those pieces and the uh, statutory mission for each of the agencies and develop what we call learning agendas. Each agency in the department develops a learning agenda in coordination with my office and uh, comes up with a priority list of evaluation and research and analysis, uh, data analysis uh, topics and projects that would be of use. On this chart at the bottom on the left gives you a sense of the kinds of capacity uh, activities we're involved with in, one of which is data quality and access, both for um, good evaluations and for data analysis, both uh, internally and um, through modeling. And on the right gives you a sense of some of the kinds of data analysis that our data analytics unit does. The types of evaluations we do are sort of the standard that many in this room uh, know about. We have formal evaluations using uh, experimental design, uh, random control trials, and uh, treatment and control groups to measure and estimate formal net impacts between a treatment group and a control group. We also have many uh, rapid cycle behavioral tests, sort of the nudge tests. We have about a dozen of those going on. All of those typically use uh, administrative data to uh, test different uh, process changes. We also do uh, quasi-experimental analysis with created comparison groups and statistical matching techniques where we have a, um, a treatment group and comparison groups and uh, various levels of analysis at the national level, state level, local level, grantee level, program level, uh, demonstrations, strategies, and models. The outcome uh, uh, analysis that's done uses um, it, it mostly econometric uh, statistical modeling, uh, microsimulation work, again, using uh, big databases. And uh, we do a lot of survey analysis, often in collaboration with BLS and uh, statistical analysis with BLS and census data. And then uh, I just want to put in one little plug for implementation and management evaluations which is very important and uses both quantitative and qualitative uh, data, usually at the program administrative level and often with surveys. So what are some of the priority uh, data issues that we need? We need to have the appropriate outcome variables, um, usually earnings uh, and wages and income, but also um, the information that might be in evaluations of some of our enforcement agencies, which would be compliance rates and activities related to uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act compliance, um, workplace injuries and fatalities for some of the worker protection agency evaluations we do. We need appropriate independent variables. This is critical for evaluations. We need as, uh, as much uh, um, uh, independent variable information that we can get, both about the labor market conditions, the characteristics of the individuals and families, but also business characteristics of, on the firm side as well, and you can see some of the other variables that we typically need. We need uh, the time frame has to be aligned to the evaluation goals, whatever that might be, and each evaluation is different. What's important is that we need pre-program earnings as well as post-program earnings to do a good evaluation. Um, Pre-program may include information on education, um, earnings, but and then on the firm side could mean um, business, uh, business functions, business characteristics, and uh, enforcement history. We always want micro-level data, as micro as we can get it. A aggregate data doesn't help much with, um, with evaluations. We need longitudinal uh, data where the, where the uh, information can be linked together, and related to that, we need an agile way to merge data longitudinally. We need to be able to link 
data from different sources together and um, using unique identifiers, often for individuals, that's social security numbers. We're working uh, across federal agencies led by OMB to think about um, firm and establishment unique identifiers that could be more readily uh, used, but we absolutely need to be able to link uh, the data that uh, exist and critically important for evaluations, we need to be able to link other evaluation data that are being collected over time, whether it's from surveys or program data that may be from the field, from states, or from nonprofit organization service providers. So uh, we need a way that we can continuously add to the research data files that we're uh, using. So the priority uh, data systems and issues for evaluations, uh, we also need to make sure that the data that we're accessing have the uh, adequate data infrastructure that uh, we can use at the federal level where staff analysts are using it, but also by third party uh, researchers who may be in universities or in contractor organizations. And for validation, we need to know the underlying data, the source data, and that usually means before it's been cleaned and scrubbed. Um, we need, again, to have timely access, uh, security. We have very strict uh, security and um, informed consent uh, procedures that we need, and cost efficient. Uh, it is not unusual when we have a national evaluation that it could cost over a million dollars to get the earnings data that we need from states. Uh, we always get what we need, but sometimes it costs a lot and takes a long time. So the wish list to improve the data for evaluations. For many of our um, employment and training evaluations, earnings data is what we need. Uh, we need a direct and less costly access to earnings records, uh, particularly those that are produced already by the Department of Labor's own state employment security agency partners, um, and particularly the National Directory of New Hires and uh, LEHD both get quarterly earnings data from our state agencies, but there are statutory limitations that mean we cannot access that data at the, at the uh, Department of Labor. I hope that will be changed. Um, we need firm identifiers, as I've already mentioned. Um, I would hope that the Commission will also look at reforming the uh, Paperwork Reduction Act to make it uh, more streamlined, less costly uh, process so that we don't have to um, halt or uh, stop evaluations because we're still waiting for uh, PRA approval. Um, we need a more streamlined process for sharing data uh, across agencies. Uh, we all, I think, want to work more across agencies, but the cumbersome uh, IAA process right now uh, is very limiting in terms of being able to data share and match at the federal level. And again, uh, having some more clarity and consistency in procedures across federal agencies, by federal agency, about uh, sharing data and about privacy and security information. Um, I will stop there. I have more that I could say, but here on the last chart is how you can reach me. We have our uh, website that would have the evaluation policy statement about uh, data integrity and uh, independence, and our clearinghouse, which has evaluation guidelines and standards. Thank you. Uh, let me make a recommendation first. That you, personally, I mean, you can free to ignore it if you'd like. We've heard a lot about interagency uh, issues with data. I think it would be really helpful. Uh, I realize it's the end of administration, but we're still going to be seriously engaged until spring. I think it'll be sometime in the spring before we start writing our report. If there were an interagency group of some kind that could send us the five most important things that we should recommend that would make it uh, easier for agencies to cooperate with each other, including data sharing, I think that would be really helpful. And I'm sure OMB would be, well, I'm never sure about anything for OMB, but uh, maybe OMB could help facilitate that, and you could do it. It's not the kind of thing that would take, you know, six months. So you, one or two meetings, I think you could come up with a great list. So we, that would be. We a great, already have a list, okay, so we well, will write it up. <laughs> all right. Well, it, it, what I'm thinking That's of great. is some of our recommendations are going to require legislative action. You've mentioned several. Yes. Uh, 
And if we can say in our report that uh, five agencies agreed and you know, so forth, I think it, it, it'll provide a little political backing mm -hmm. uh, to what we're trying to do. I want to ask you one question. Um, especially after Chetty's work on moving to opportunity, it, it, I think a lot of people already knew this, but the further we can follow samples, not only the more we're going to find out, but sometimes there are big surprises, like moving to opportunity was really a surprise. We would never have known if we didn't follow up 10, 15 years later. Do you have, as a chief evaluator, and the data that you have, especially on wages and employment and income, is exactly the kind of thing we need to know in the long term. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about this? Have you tried to increase, figure out ways that studies that you fund or states or other agencies can follow people for a longer period of time and do you have recommendations about things that we could that we could recommend that would facilitate that process um, yes I mean we, what we try to do so for example right now we probably have three evaluations large-scale um, formal evaluations where we have a an additional contract where we are extending the follow-up for several more years which would give us you know 10 years or longer for some of the evaluations. So that's important. What, what can be done, I think, is, again, um, some kind of statutory or regulatory changes that have to do with the length of time that a, a contract can be uh, allowed. Because right now, we have limitations on how long a federal contract can exist. It would help, for example, if we had no year funding, rather than funding that had to be obligated or expended within a certain period of time to allow the evaluations to go out over a longer period of time. But we can include those kinds of um, suggestions also in um, material that we can send to you. Other questions from members of the commission? Hillary. Thank you for your presentation. It's a great way to start out the morning. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more. I, I, I very much wanted to second what, what Ron had to say and get input as, as to what the major impediments are. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, your view about the paper, Paperwork Reduction Act and, and how that you know, sort of affects things on, on the ground. And I, and I wanted to ask one other thing on a different topic, um, answer them however you like. You just talked about <clears throat> extending contracts in order to have longer-term follow-ups. What's also happening in in the research world that I live in is that you know people are very outside researchers are very motivated and interested in d engaging in these kinds of activities as well. So I wonder, um, in terms of the um, issues around interagency sharing and sharing more broadly, what your thoughts are and impediments to that are. Okay, um, on the um, PRA, I mean, we, you might want to have a whole session devoted to um, the PRA issues. I think that the PRA serves an, a critical, important function to make sure that we are not overburdening um, the respondents in data collection and that we are um, cognizant of data security and data privacy. But w what happens is that it, it is sort of over time, it, there's been a little bit of, um, more than a little bit of mission creep to include um, requiring uh, PRA submissions to OMB and clearances for even minimal, um, non-invasive, non-sensitive, and uh, um, evaluation information rather than just focusing on program data collection that affects the general public. And, um, the PRA um, requirement adds costs to each of the evaluations because the contractors that we, ha most of our evaluations are done by independent outside contractors for, third, for transparency and independence. And it adds um, extensive cost and time to the uh, contract because the contractor has to develop, sometimes it may take four or five months to develop the PRA package, and then it could take, a, some of our PRA packages have taken longer than a year before we hear back from OMB, which means that your, your, um, the, the cash register is clicking on the contract side while you're waiting for that clearance. But we can get you more information on that. We've thought about 
options that could minimize it. So for example, agencies like ours that has a very sophisticated um, evaluation office with our own um, intensive peer review, technical review, security um, policies and, and uh, technical guidelines, maybe there's a way that um, OMB could delegate some of the PRA functions to those uh, agencies that already have the functions um, in-house. Uh, data sharing, I think that's an issue that the Commission should look at. For many of the uh, data items that might be of interest, there is either a legal or um, regulatory restriction on uh, re-releasing data so that even if, even if the researchers might be able to get it, they can't release to another third party, which means it's harder for academics, for example, to uh, analyze some of the same data without going again through, for example, if you're get, trying to get um, LEHD data from a census, it could easily take over an, a year to get approval. And depending on what data are being accessed, you may not be able to redisclose that data to a third party that's contracted or has a grant to do the evaluations. So the data access is a critical issue, and I think we all understand the importance of having the protections for privacy and security. But right now, it limits the ability to, to do comprehensive evaluations, and it limits the amount of time that we can have for doing it, and it also limits the access for academics to uh, engage in collaborative research with the agencies. Other questions? Allison. Thank you, and thank you, Demetra, for your presentation today and really for being a leader in this work. And I just wanted to take a minute on the PRA as the OMB representative um, to acknowledge that, you know, we understand that there are delays, but to also kind of say that we, you know, we have a statute that binds us, and so to the, the extent that issue. there's a collection that impacts 10 or more people, we, we take a look, but absolutely would be open to having conversations and hearing from all of you about ways that we can improve the process and think about, I mean, over the years, OMB has tried to oh, apply yes. the PRA as, as flexibly as we can, but don't want to minimize the, the challenges that all of you are facing. So just endorsing the idea of having some, some further conversation about that and thinking about the way that we can balance public transparency and the purposes for which the PRA was established. Robert Shea. Uh, wait, on this point? No. Okay, you're next. <laughs> Robert Shea. Demetra, thanks for being here. Um, can you talk about the impact of your work on policy? To what extent is there interest um, in your work from the policymakers at the department, Congress, OMB, and what what changes have resulted from your work? Um, there's there's increasing interest in evaluation because of um, the White House and OMB's and Congress's focus on evidence, and that is really good. And uh, especially, I, I have to uh, commend the guidance and the direction from OMB around budget submission. So the, the budget um, instructions now um, uh, clearly indicate that if uh, a department or an agency or program's budget submission request is asking for additional funds, there must be an evidence justification for that, which, which that in itself has, um, has increased the, um, the use of and the the value of evaluation and research um, and performance information uh, throughout uh, the department. We spend a lot of time, and I think we're uh, getting better at it. We're, we're continuously working on better ways to communicate um, the findings that come out of evaluations for non-researcher, non-evaluators, non-techie people to understand it. So drawing those implications, it's really um, an increasing emphasis on, for example, having practice briefs and program briefs in order to do that. We have um, a number. One thing I, I uh, often tell this little two-second story, Ron, I won't take much time. When, um, when Secretary Perez uh, first came to the uh, department, and he is a huge supporter of evaluation, um, the second day that he was on the job, he said to me, so what works in job training? I have been doing research on job training for 40 years, and the next day I gave him a two-page memo based on 
the accumulation of knowledge um, summarized down to a level that can be useful for someone at his level. And uh, so I think job training is an area where we continue to need more research, but it's an area with huge interest. Other um, areas where research is contributing, for example, would be some positive results we have around uh, registered apprenticeship, which has led to a uh, tripling of, uh, of the White House targets, goals, and funding around registered apprenticeship. So that is really good. And we have an accumulating body of research around um, effective strategies for um, improving outcomes for former, formerly incarcerated individuals that's leading toward revising and improving the programs there. So can, can you ask a brief question and Demetri give a brief answer? Uh, I can try. <laughs> I, I guess uh, two, two questions. So I was involved in a DOL study eight, nine years ago um, on um, the, the WIA program. Mm -hmm. And uh, DO, um, I was working with a contractor and we had a grant. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, a letter went out from DOL asking all 50 states to provide us their UI wage record data. Mm -hmm. and, and we got UI wage record data from 11 in a timely fashion. The 12th tried to but couldn't pull it off. Um, y you seem to suggest that that's improved, um, and, and perhaps it has. I was kind of surprised that a letter from DOL telling the states to give us data that for their project was so roundly ignored. That's, so I'd like maybe a little more detail in has it improved or if it hasn't, what we could do to improve it. And my second question is, is along the lines of um, Bob's question. Um, how do we get evaluation studies done in a timely fashion so that it can actually affect um, um, program funding? So, for example, the, the, the experimental study of WIA, which was supposed to be done, I think, it, in 2015, has still not been released to a year and a half after WIOA has already been refunded. So presumably, and at this point, any, any release of it, people can say, oh, we completely changed the program, which, of course, they didn't. Um, but how do we get studies done so that they can actually have an impact on the next funding round because far too often it seems to me that the evaluation studies come out after you know congress has taken action to to change the program to change the program funding okay i'll give you highlights of that but i'm happy to talk to you more um on both of those on uh, accessing earnings data we are doing better right now for example and again it changes with different administrations Eight years ago or nine years ago, not eight years, but nine years it ago, was it was very difficult to get access to NDNH, the National Directory of New Hires, which really is the best, most comprehensive source of um, earnings data, again, from our um, unemployment insurance agencies at the uh, state level, but we can not um, easily access the at the national level. Um, HHS has um, has a, a approved um, requests from the Labor Department for over 12 evaluations where we are getting NDNH data, so that would be nationwide coverage, which is great. So in that way, it's much better. Still, sometimes we, um, and the uh, WIA evaluation is a good example of this, where you may need a national uh, sample um, according to the statutory requirements to evaluate that program, you need about 27 states in order to get a nationally representative sample. And um, our evaluations got all 27 to give the UI earnings data, but it cost over a million dollars to get that, to get the data that are needed. So we are doing better. Um, we also have a policy in place for non-WIOA. WIOA has a special provision that does not allow for um, a national database, which makes it difficult to do linking because you don't have a unique identifier. Um, for other programs like unemployment insurance, the Trade Adjustment uh, Act, we have, um, uh, the Secretary has authority to require states to provide that data. Okay, thank you.